the easiest map. So it's a narrow road. Uh, if you search that in your app store or your Google Play store, and there's a giving link in there. Or if you go to the website, what we we don't have we don't have a, a building. That's why we're here at Tatter Flag today. And that's on purpose so that we don't have the expense of a building or rent or mortgage or utilities or anything like that. We like to bounce around. We like to be mobile. Um, and this allows us to, as we gather as microchurches and we do things together, um, part of that giving goes out to help aid that process. And um, so when you give, it's not like, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm just giving to the pastor's salary. That's not the way it is here. And um, so if you if you have any questions about online giving, you can see me. Um, I'm probably the one that is. Or, I mean, you know pretty well. So, yeah, so you can get the link off of it. So if you have any questions, let me know. So, Lauren, I love what you said. Where are you? There you are. I love what you said about coming to me if you're tired. And that verse, I actually, I think I posted it this morning on our idea sharing. Come to me, all you who are weary and tired, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So whatever sort of sense of anxiety that you feel or pressure or like a mounting to-do list, whatever's going on in your head or your heart that's making you feel rushed, tired, busy, stressed, I want you to just close your eyes right now. And I want you to imagine a time where you've really felt at peace. So God, we just thank you that you invite us back into rest. There are moments and experiences that we have and have had with you. There are times where we felt your presence really super tangibly. And so we ask that you would invite us back into your rest, wherever we're at. Currently, but even throughout the day, when we're driving in the car and we feel sort of burnt out, we love the fact that you are omnipresent. You're with us everywhere. You're with us in the car. You're with us on the sidewalk. You're with us in the living room. You're with us in the grocery store. And we are free to experience your presence everywhere and every place all the time. So as we feel sort of tired and, and stressed and anxious and like there's all sort of pressure on us, help us to pause. Help us to feel the freedom to pause, not, not even the pressure to pause, but the freedom to pause, that we're able to break away and just take a collective sigh and be with you. We thank you that you're with us now, but you're with us all the time. We love you. Amen. Guys, today, Tony and I wanted to talk together about a topic that I get really fired up about, passionate about, and that is adventure. I'll use language of liminality and communitas if you're not familiar with those words, the idea of liminality is being put in liminal space or being put in an environment or experience of disorientation, being put somewhere where you feel uncomfortable, it's somewhere new, it's somewhere different, it's somewhere challenging. And if you look throughout the scriptures, you see God meeting people in these places that you'd call like liminal, like up on a mountain or in a storm, in these uncomfortable environments where people are stretched and they're forced to grow. And oftentimes, we're very risk-averse, right? We want to sort of get to this place of safety and comfort and security and all of that. And we even sort of picture faith as like a really predictable, safe, secure, you know what's going to happen. People sort of assume this is what's going to happen. If I go to a church service, they're going to play the few songs, and then the guy's going to get up and speak, and if I go into this Bible study, we're going to sit down around couches, we're going to get something to eat, you sort of know what's going to happen, it's very predictable. But you, there's no way that you could say following Jesus for the disciples that walk with him was predictable. They had no idea when they got up in the morning, where are we going to end up today? 
And they had no idea. They didn't know whether they'd be hugging lepers, or they'd be on the top of a mountain, or they'd be sitting with prostitutes and tax collectors, they'd be with Pharisees or in a boat. They had no idea. Every day was sort of this wild ride and adventure. And you know for them, they were comfortable sitting around with other Jews, going to the falafel house, you know, like eating, eating Jewish food, hanging out in Jewish places. Yet, Jesus had to go to Samaria. He wanted to take them into a place and around a group of people that was very taboo. The Jews never went and hung out with Samaritan people. And Jesus loved to take his disciples into spaces around groups of people that would stretch them and challenge them and cause them to grow. I think this is where real growth happens, is that we step a little bit outside of our comfort zone, right? I mean, this is a topic you and I constantly, when we talk about faith not being boring, lame, predictable, but being full of adventure, risk, danger, excitement. There's no way. Could you picture anyone ever saying that Jesus, anyone who ever met Jesus, that Jesus was boring? Yet, how many people associate Christianity with boring? Should never be so. There's no way we look like Jesus if people would then go, boring, predictable, safe. No way. Because those who encounter Jesus, their, their hearts would beat a little bit faster. They'd feel, this is where the title came from, nervous energy. It's like when you go to Hershey Park or whatever park and you see this ride that you've never rode and it's really big and intense or maybe you're going to go skydiving or something and you're excited about it but there's like this nervous energy and you're like I want to do it but do I want to do it and I'm sort of afraid but I know it'll be fun and I want to step out but my heart's beating a little bit faster and imagine if we shrunk back from all of those experiences that's when we really truly, truly feel like we lived Remember that day, remember that ride, remember that moment, remember that experience, remember when you got down on one knee and you proposed, remember when you went to that place that you've never been to and you were scared but you stepped out of your comfort zone. This is when we feel like we've truly lived. Right, and this is something that we can actually like train ourselves to do. Uh, and it's fun, like, and we're gonna get into some experiences that we've had together later, but um, I know, when I go out to eat with Mike, or he comes to Tattered Flag and we meet for lunch or whatever, he'll often say to the waiter or waitress, what do you recommend? Like, what do you what do you like? And whatever that is, unless it has onions in it, <laughs> he, will, he will get that, not knowing if he's gonna like it. It's, it's just, and that's, and I remember years ago, you told me that was one way you were training yourself to, to put yourself in the space of the analogy. So yeah, the, the concept is is forced randomization. So you're going to go to a movie and you say, two tickets to the next show. No idea what it's going to be. You're about to board a flight. You go, all right, I'm going to get four random magazines. Could be gardening, guns, whatever. Right? The idea is that you're stretching yourself to think about things and see the world through a different lens. Because we always, how, how many experiences do you miss, miss out on because you always get the bacon cheeseburger? And the bacon cheeseburger is good, but... There's a whole world of flavors. There's a landscapes. Take a different route. Brush with your left hand, right? Whatever. You gotta change and get yourself thinking outside of the normal muscle memory that, that we live into. So many people, you know, I, I love that people read Paul, and oftentimes in the church world, people are like, man, I just just want to do a Bible study on Paul. And we almost get this sense of like. Faith, read, what? Hold the mic lower. Higher? No, I'm getting that it's muffled. It's muffled? Do I need it higher? Lower. Okay. <laughs> I'm too loud. Sorry. Um, you, 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 get, you get this like sense with, with Paul and with faith that people think, for some reason, that a Bible study on community is spiritual but community is not spiritual. Or a Bible study on mission is spiritual, but hanging out with atheist neighbors or coworkers is not spiritual. 
Okay. Wouldn't you think that the application of what you're reading is actually more <laughs> spiritual than just talking about it? It's when the words of what you're reading in the Bible literally come off of the pages and sit around your table. You literally watch your faith come to life when you don't just talk about it, but you go, whatever we're reading, care for the orphans and the widows, this is pure religion. You look around in your community and you go, who are the single moms? Who are the orphans and the widows? Who are the people that are hurting? Where Jesus sat with tax collectors and sinners. Who are the people that nobody's sitting with? Who's not getting invited to the party? What if we throw a good party next week? We have a great barbecue and we invite people around just like Jesus would invite them around. And people are brought around their table and valued and their stories are heard and they're loved. My faith is going to feel more alive if I live it than if I talk about it. That's when, you're, that's when your heart starts beating faster and you feel alive. Not because you sit around and theorize, but because you actually put your boots on. To follow Jesus, I'd say, you got to put your boots on because Jesus was always moving. He said stuff like, you know what, come with me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Foxes have holes, birds have nests. I don't have a pillow. Come and follow me, it'll be the best decision you ever made. You're probably gonna kill us, it'll be amazing. Let's go. He invited people to walk with him and then he said, when you come, don't even bring a backpack. Don't bring your wallet. Don't bring a change of clothes. We're just gonna go and whoever welcomes us in, we're gonna eat there. Don't worry about it. And I think for so many of us, we want whatever makes us feel comfortable or safe or secure. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that you have to take the most dangerous, daring step or be martyred this week. But what I am saying is we need to start to get used to a step of adventure, life, risk, because that's part of what it meant to follow Jesus. This not only stretches us when we do this and expands our horizons and our viewpoints, but it, as you said, lends value to those that you are getting around the table with. I remember one of my dishwashers in Middletown, I had no idea when we hired him, but it turns out he was on like a semi-pro skateboarding team, right? So he was part of this. And I remember one day he rode his skateboard to work, and I thought, okay, that's a little different. Right, so I, I asked him, you know, what's that about? And he starts telling me about this skate group that he's with. And we sat for like 45 minutes, and he just taught me about skateboarding and this group that he is with, and now they're, they've become his best friends. And all of a sudden, this guy who really just kept his head down and did dishes I never got to know, he got to teach me something, and that was valuable, not only to me, to get to know him and learn a little bit about what makes him tick, but for him, recognizing like, okay, I have value in this conversation. So it, it really does. It, it teaches us that it also, it, it creates this value system for people who might not feel valued otherwise. Yeah, so part of it is not just love does not insist on its own way. So you go, what are you interested in? I'm going to become interested in it. right? So for one person, a step of adventure, risk, danger might be, I am going to go to the park and connect with another family and talk to other parents that have kids and I'm an introvert and I'm afraid and my heart's pounding and I'm sort of nervous to talk to a stranger but I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone and meet a new person. Maybe that's a step of liminality for you. For me, that's not. I mean, that's cake, right? But part of liminality for me might be I'm comfortable going to the park playing basketball with strangers, talking to other families. However, if there are a whole group of Indian guys at that park playing cricket, and I don't know these guys, I don't know their language, I don't know cricket, but I walk up and say, hey, I'm watching you play cricket. I've never played before. Could you teach me? That's a step of liminality. That's getting my heart beating. That's putting me in unfamiliar territory and disorientation and causing me to grow and stretch me and introducing me to a new group of people in a different setting. These are the types of things. So my point is liminality and, and adventure and risk for me might be different than you. I think of it this way. It's 10% outside of your comfort zone. 
What is a step that you can take that's 10% outside of your comfort zone? Maybe for you it's, I'm gonna invite somebody to have a cup of coffee with me this week from work. I'm gonna invite someone to hang out for happy hour afterwards. Maybe that's a step that's really dangerous or scary for you. I'm gonna buy coffee for the person that's in line behind me. I'm gonna cover the tab of the people sitting at the table next to me. See, these simple steps that might feel a little awkward or I don't want to look weird or whatever it is. Maybe somebody's going through something difficult and a big step that you've never taken is to say, can I pray for you? <laughs> I'm afraid, I'm nervous. You just say, can I pray for you? And you pray for him. Maybe that's the most dangerous thing you've ever done in your faith, but it starts to move you on that journey toward Christ's likeness. Right? So, so one of the one of the great examples that I love is there, there's a story about this. Hi guys. There's a story about this 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 tribe. It was in the bush. That their kids grew up sort of nurtured by by mom, and they had dad that was sort of toughening them up, teaching them to be tough. And the boys, once they got to the age of around 13 years old, all the fathers would kidnap their boys in the middle of the night. They're 13 year old boys. They kidnap their boys in the middle of the night and then they take them off into this remote area. And all the fathers of the village would sit down with the boys and they would lecture the boys and talk to the boys about what it meant to become a man. Oh, I gotta put the mic down more. Sorry guys. I can't help it. And they would lecture the boys on what it meant to become a man. And, and they'd sit around and they'd talk to them about survival and risk and danger and providing and being strong and being courageous. And they'd say all this sort of stuff and they'd sit around a fire and, and they'd give them some tips on survival and all that kind of stuff. And then they would say to the boys, all right, we're leaving, we'll see you in a month. If you survive. And then they left the boys. And inevitably, what would happen is the first couple of days, each of the boys would go out on their own. But after a couple of days, the boys would realize, uh-oh, I don't think I'm going to make it by myself. And so we got to team up together. And so a 13-year-old boy would find another 13-year-old boy, and they would start to team up together, and a group of them together would go, you know what, we've got to protect ourselves from the elements. So they'd build some sort of makeshift hut with a roof to try to protect them from the elements and then they learn that we've got to like catch fish together and we got to learn to build a fire and we got to eat we got to make sure that we stay alive and they would sort of work together to try to stay alive now what do you think happened after a month when the fathers came back and they sat down with the boys those boys were bonded for life because they overcame some sort of adventure or ordeal or danger or risk, but they were in it together and for the rest of their lives. They tell the stories and you can even hear the fathers and the grandfathers sitting around the fire and they come together to celebrate that they all survived, that these boys survived. And as they're telling the stories, you'd hear one old man looking at the other old man and go, hey, remember ours? Remember when we were running and we had that lion chasing us and we climbed up that tree and you had to pee on him to stay alive, and you got your leg, didn't you, right? They're sort of laughing, and they're, they're sitting around telling these stories, but they lived, they made it, and they were together, and they were bonded for life. And I think, if you want to think about the mission, if you want to think about the journey that Jesus has us on through that lens, look at Jesus and the disciples. I'm going to say this, and Tony and I, Bryce was with us too, when we went to Montenegro. Now let me ask you this. Have you noticed that a group of people sitting in a church building in room 201 every Thursday night at 7 p.m., and they go, we want to be a community. We want to be like a family. We want to be a close-knit band of brothers and sisters, and they come together in the safety of room 201, reading Bible stories for seven years straight together, praying together, trying to be close. And then you've got this other group that they didn't, they hardly knew each other. 
But they went on this mission trip to Haiti. And then after they get back from this mission trip to Haiti, they're tighter together than the group that's been meeting in a Bible study for seven years. Why is that? They went to a different land in a different place. They experienced adversity and struggle and trial and danger. And they bonded together. They had to overcome interpersonal issues. They had to forgive each other. They watched God work in a different territory. They saw somebody else's life transformed. And through that, for the rest of their life, they're going to tell those stories. We went to Montenegro. That was a bond for the rest of our lives. We played, well, we didn't play. Reese and Wendy went with us, and they played in bars and pubs in Montenegro. It was hysterical. They're playing in bars and pubs, and the, and the Montenegrins didn't know what they were singing. They were singing worship songs. And these Montenegrins are like grinding on each other. <laughs> what is that? This is so weird. What is happening? They were like playing. They were playing. In, in a, I kid you not. You can't make this up. There was a Chuck Norris bar in Montenegro. Was that, was that Chuck the Norris where, statements all over the Was that the one where the woman came up and put her hat on Reese during Molly's Oh, yeah. Hat. She like just put her hat on him. Yeah, they had no idea what was going on. <laughs> it was hysterical. And we, we saw people come to faith in that, which was incredible. We, we spoke to soccer clubs. We traveled together. We ate together. We laughed together. We, we had them threaten us to shut down our operation on the street or they were going to send the police. I go into a public school. We're all sitting there. I'm supposed to speak about Christianity in the West. And the headmaster comes up and right before I'm about to speak. And he said, hey, before you speak, I just want you to know, I, I, we don't want you to say anything about Jesus. And I'm like, that's my whole presentation. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever. I'm just going to say what I was going to say anyway. So I get up and I share that passionately about Jesus. And I can see in the back of the room. The headmaster and another guy like talking to each other, and I'm going, oh crap, I'm in trouble. I see him shaking his head. You even got called to the principal's office. I did get yeah. called to the principal's yeah. office. So right afterwards, the headmaster says, I want you to come with me. He takes me, one of the other guys from our group, down the hallway. We go down to his office. We go into his office. He shuts the door behind us. He says, sit down. And as I sit down, I'm thinking, oh no. And I know there's... You know, other faiths over there, and you can be thrown in jail. And I'm thinking, is this guy going to, like, shoot me in the head here? What is going on? He reaches in to this back closet in his office. And when he gets back in the back closet, I'm like, <laughs> liminal moment. <laughs> My heart is pounding. I'm nervous. And he pulls out a bottle of scotch. And he pours shots for me and the guy with me. And he went, that was awesome. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and I'm in a public school in Montenegro taking shots with the headmaster. <laughs> after talking about Jesus when they told me not to. Tell me that stuff doesn't bond you. Tell me that isn't what faith is meant to be, that we step out of our comfort zone and watch God work in these really interesting and wild experiences. It's what we still talk about. We still talk about when, you know, on that trip, we were on a bus, like this little bus, oh my God. and the guy hosting us, um, Dragon, was that his name? His, he, so he was, the, he was the former Yugoslavia men's national soccer team goalie. His name was Dragon Rakic. Yep. Yeah, he, he was crazy. I mean, truly crazy. And crazy he's dragging dragon. this thing, and we're going up the side of this mountain to a monastery, right? Yep. And... I mean, literally, the the lane is not wider than like it's not wide enough for it's, two bucks. It's like it's like one and a half lanes, and there's no guardrail. No, they, they don't believe. They don't believe Montenegro means black mountain, so it's all mountainous, and they don't believe in guardrails. <laughs> so we're going by a bus, and and we're on the we're on the outside, yep. literally our tire hanging over the edge. Bryce curls up in the fetal position. It's <laughs> not a joke. He literally was on the floor of the van in the fetal position. And that is what we still talk about. We don't, we, you know, that's, that's Remember the that moment? Two you know? drops of ether. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. They had us in their home. And when they had us in their home, their 
animals walking around outside. And they've got they've got a bit like a vine with grapes growing over her head. And she's picking the dragon's wife's picking fruit off for us. And they bring out all this cheese and fruits and breads. And we're all sitting together like eating and feasting and we're stuck, right? Right, we thought that was dinner. We thought that was dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So we're like absolutely stuck. And then she and then she went, appetizer over. <laughs> and then she brings out all this meat and potatoes and all this stuff. And she goes, eat, eat. And all the all the meat are in the two liter bottle. The no meat are in a little bit empty. <laughs> and then Dragon brings out this like ancient instrument that I've never seen yeah. before. And he said it was passed down from his great great grandfather. And he starts playing it in front of us. And then afterwards, he turns to the guy that led us on this trip and he hands the instrument to, to him and says, I want you to have it. You're my brother. And we were like, Ooh. right? Yeah. Powerful moments. But then this is. It can start here. Think about this. Jesus lived his entire life and ministry and journey. We think we've got to go somewhere overseas. We've got to go to Montenegro. We've got to go to Italy. We've got to go to Africa. We think we've got to move somewhere else to make a difference. Yet Jesus' plan for world transformation was staying in a section of land the size of New Jersey his whole life. But he was so deep in that culture and with those people, and he knew their stories, and he ate their food, and he walked their streets, and he cried alongside of them. And he saw the people that you walk past every day and don't notice because they don't have the same hobbies or interests or background as you. Jesus saw them, and he engaged them. So I think for me, one of the, one of the experiences of womenality for me, really simple early on, was when I coached Mikey in soccer, and if you know me, I don't know soccer very well. That's true. They were desperate. <laughs> they were super de like they're desperate for coaches, and they asked me to coach, and I'm like, I don't know the game of soccer. I've never played soccer. They're like, you'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so desperate. So I went I went ahead and I started watching YouTube videos, like about basics of soccer. My brother-in-law started sending me videos, and I'm like trying to figure it out. I get out there with a group of kids, and Bruna teams up with me. She's, she was from Brazil, so she knew the game of soccer, loved it, she teamed up. I was just loud and yelling at the kids, and she was actually new to the game. And so we got all the kids together, and I'm like trying to coach them up, and I'm like, all right, kids, here's how you do it. Here's how you, here's how you kick the ball in. And so I put the soccer ball down, and, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to give it a nice boot and show them how to kick this sucker in. And all the kids are, are lining up, and I'm like, watch me. And I go, boom, like that. And it just hit my foot just right that that thing sailed all the way over the field, <laughs> over the fence, hit the back hill, bounced off the hill, went into the street. Cars are swerving. Everyone's like, oh. And I'm like, putting my head down. But that whole experience... I was, I was not in my element. It was like some sort of weird Disney movie. <laughs> like, this guy has no idea what he's doing. Hopefully there's a happy ending. And at the, at the end of that whole experience, I connected with a bunch of families because I put myself out there in unfamiliar territory doing something that I wasn't comfortable doing. But through that, I met some people. One of the guys that I met when we had this end of the season party he saw on Facebook that I was a part of the church leadership team. And so he, he says to me, first thing he says to me is, I'm not into any of that religious crap. That's the first thing he says to me, right? And so I knew right away that this guy's like antagonistic. Find out, find out that he's an atheist. We became friends. And so we're hanging out. We're occasionally getting a drink together. And over the course of several months, He's sharing his heart and his story and his challenges. We got together for beer one night, and he, it was after the hurricane um, down in Texas. He's a former military guy. And so this guy decides when he saw the crisis 
from the hurricane down in Texas. He's going to get a bunch of his buddies together, and they're going to rent a truck, take a week off of work, go down to Texas, and they're going to help rescue people that are stuck in you know, all the water down there in Texas. And so I'm like, this is amazing. So he's telling me his story about how he went down there, put himself in danger, took a week off of work to help all these people. He's raising money to help them. And I'm like, dude, I know that you're not in the faith or religion or any of that, but what you're doing, what you just did on that trip, looks like Jesus. And Jesus is my hero. And I just love that story of what you're doing. That's very Jesus-like, whether you like it or not. And I just really dig what you're doing. So through the course of a few more months later, he had a couple personal trials and issues that he was dealing with, reached out to me, we talked that week. He ended up showing up to one of our NRC gatherings on a Sunday morning at the conference center. And it happened to be a Sunday morning when Reese, you guys remember, some of you remember Reese, when Reese was playing, and Reese could get pretty charismatic, and he's, he'd get pretty charismatic as he's singing and worshiping, and, and he, he got into the song so much. And I saw, I saw this guy sitting up front, his first time there, and I'm going, oh God, help him not to get too crazy, because he's gonna, he's gonna scare this guy that just came for the first time. And so this guy's sitting up at one of our, one of our front tables, and Reese is playing music, and as he's playing, his, his hair is going back. And you, you know how Reese would do his little hair piece and flip up and cut and kind of like this. And, and then I heard him like as he's singing, he'd be like, oh, yes, Lord, yes, oh. And I'm looking up at this guy like, oh, God, help me, please. Help this guy not to run away and never come back. He's like, please help me. He's like, yes, Lord. And then it got worse. He goes, oh, just like... Just like Song of Solomon when the lover waits outside the door and says, Let me in, Lord! Let me in! And I'm looking up going, God, please help this guy not to be scared away. And so then I go on, I get up, and I, I share this story. And in the story that I'm sharing, I talk about how God calls us to, to step out and take risk, to love people even though it's inconvenient. Sort of like today's message, full circle. And I say, when God calls you to do something, sometimes you just follow that, even though it doesn't fit into your schedule or your plans, and it's inconvenient. And after that, that night, I'm sitting with Jackie, we're on the couch, and I see this email pop up from this guy that had visited that morning. And I'm thinking, oh no, he's gonna tell me that was weird. <laughs> and when I look at the email, what I see him say is, hey, what you shared this morning impacted me so much. I went out to lunch that day right after I heard you speak, and I saw this homeless guy next to the restaurant. And I got talking to the homeless guy because I remember you telling me this morning about reaching out and about how love sees people and love takes us beyond what's comfortable. And, and so I just asked this guy to tell me a story. And he said he was trying to get to Ohio and he was homeless and he, he needed to get out west and he was asking for money. And he said, so in that moment, I just felt this dose of courage that God just wanted me to take this guy to Ohio. And so I took him in my car and I drove him to Ohio. And I'm looking at this going, you've got to be kidding me. This is the same guy that said he was an atheist, shows up at our gathering, watches Reese, super charismatic, hears me share, drives a man to Ohio. I'm going, this is amazing. But this is the type of stuff that God will do if we simply take the step to go, I'm willing to coach soccer. I'm willing to invite somebody to grab a burrito. I'm willing to step outside of my normal environment doing my normal stuff, thinking of faith as just be good, show up at church, and try to be moral, that Jesus is inviting us to step into adventure and to engage the world around us in ways that really make a difference. I'm talking about that. I don't think that. <laughs> I'll let you know I won't. I'm like, Tony, you want to teach with me? Yeah. And I just teach the whole time he stands here. You know I'm not afraid to jump in, so. Yeah, no, it's good.
I, I think that the, the biggest obstacle to all this is what? Fear. Fear, right? Why are we afraid? If God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Who can be against us? What can separate us from the love of God? Perfect love cast out fear. Nobody sets out going, I'm going to bang on the door of a drug house. But I know two very close friends that have done just that very thing because their friend was in there. Why? Not because they went, I'm going to be dangerous for Jesus and bang on drug houses. <laughs> That's never how it starts. They just go, my friend's in there. And I'm afraid and I haven't heard from them. So we're going to pick their phone and try to find their location and figure out where they're at. We're going to go to this spot. We're going to bang on the door and see if they're alive. Why? Because for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Why? Because he loved us. For God so loved the world. I think our problem in not being risky or dangerous for the sake of the kingdom of God is not a lack of adventure or risk or danger. It's a lack of love. It's a lack of love. We just don't love people well. Agree? Paul said this. Think about this. Here's the guy people love to read and quote. Paul says this. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Whatever, it, whatever anyone else dares to boast, um, dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one, and I'm talking like a madman. Here's where it gets crazy. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent dangers, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food, and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure of me, of the anxiety for all the churches. That's how he lived. Shipwrecked, beaten, crazy, chaos, danger, risk. I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians, because they look so unlike your Christ. What if the first step for us was, I got your coffee? Or, we've never hung out before, you live in my neighborhood, why don't you come over for dinner? What if we just took one step, 10%, outside of our comfort zone, prayed, and said, God, I'm willing to see whatever you want to do through this. What will we see happen with our faith come to life? Yeah, I mean, it might be as simple for you as when, when it comes to overcoming fear that when you're with a group of friends and they start that gossip about that friend that's not there, right? And you're the one that steps in and says, you know what, I love that person. And yeah, they're struggling with this, but I love that person. And we should, we should include them. We should get together with them. I, I remember Devlin's up here, our bartender, Last year, um, there was a kid in her class who was really struggling with behavior. And she would come home, and like it was to the point where we were getting emails about it, you know, like the, for the, all the parents are getting emails saying it's kind of an unsafe situation, it's a behavior issue. And she would come home, and we'd ask, you know, how was so and so's day? And she would only tell us the good things, you know, she wouldn't tell us the bad things. And she would say, um, you know, when he does something good, I praise him. I, I make sure he knows that he did something good. And we got an email from her teacher that said, 
I have to remind myself every day to be more like Devlin. Right? And for her, that was no big deal, but for me, that would have been a really big deal. Right? So it's all relative, and it's all overcoming that fear and, and protecting one another, right? And, and covering for one another's sin, right? Like last night, John, right? We found out one guy didn't pay into our poker game, right? And it was probably just because we were all, we were having a little too much honey whiskey or whatever while we were playing poker. We get together as a group and play poker with our micro church. And um, at the end, when I'm divvying out the money, I realize we're $10 short. And John looks at me and he knows that I I took my $10 and put it, put it to the person who, you know, didn't pay in, right? And he looks at me and he's like, you know, because you knew, you knew what I had done. And so, but it's that it's that simple story, and I don't I don't say that to pat my back, but something just happened last night where we say we cover for one another, right? We don't want to embarrass that person, right? We want to include that person and, and cover them. So, for for you, that might be it. That might be in your neighborhood, the neighbor that no one likes going, you know what? I'm going to have one of for coffee, and your neighbors are going to look at you weird, right? They're going to put the curtains out, and, and they're going to look at you weird. You had one time where your neighbor said. You don't like the people. I don't like the people you're bringing into our. When you bring them into your home, you bring them into my neighborhood, right? Yeah. And that's the type of love that, that we're that we're talking about. Love overcomes fear. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I think tangible step because faith without works is dead. Grab your phone, your your tablet, your notebook, whatever you have, and right now ask God the question. You can close your eyes. You can. Stare off like a 14 year old. Um, whatever you got to do, right? Just, just take a moment with God and say, What is the step that I could take with this that's 10% outside of my comfort zone? What is, a, what is a step forward that would be a little scary, risky, give, give me some like nervous energy to step out the way that God's calling me to step out? What is one step God may want you to take this week? Be a little bit, a little bit scary, but could propel you into adventure. Just write that down. Those of you that are watching from your different micro churches, just write something down. One step you can take for a risk or adventure. 10% outside of your comfort zone. And while you're writing that down, I'm going to have you write something else down. Um, there's a, there's a couple named John and Stacy Eldridge who are church leaders, and they wrote two books. The first one was Wild at Heart, and John wrote that. And it is so, the, for the men out there, I encourage you to pick up this book. And this is what it talks about. It talks about adventure. It talks about our need for adventure and, and how God called us to that. And then his wife Stacy wrote a book called Captivating. And for the ladies, I encourage you to definitely read that. And the same thing, how God's called um, a woman's heart to adventure. And Lauren and I have both read those books multiple times. And then, if you love them, I encourage you, if you're a couple, to swap and read the other. Because when she read Wild at Heart, it helped her understand my um, my calling better and, and vice versa. So definitely check those out. Yeah, and while we're at the books, let me add two more. Okay? We can do this all day. Because we're, yeah. we're geeks, we love to read. So I have two more. One is The Faith of Leap. Faith of Leap. It's about adventure, danger, risk, and faith. The second one is Keep Christianity Weird. Keep Christianity Weird. Awesome. Let me pray for you guys. Or, Tony, why don't you pray for her since I did most of the talking? Why don't you pray for all of us? God, we thank you for um, calling us into adventure. We know that you were going to execute your plan with or without us. You had an end goal in mind, but uh, and you have the power to do that. You don't need us, but you you choose to include us in, in adventure and in risk because it it changes it changes who we are, it changes uh, how we think, it changes most importantly how we love. And so, God, I thank you for the opportunity to do that. I thank you that you're with us as we go on those adventures, whether that adventure is um, on a boat in the high seas or inviting the strange neighbor over for coffee. Um, you invite us into that. 
We thank you for the thrill that it gives us. We thank you for the stretching that it does. We thank you for how it changes lives, how it, how it changes futures, and that you use us to do that. The scriptures tell us that if, if we don't do it, you're going to have a rocks crying. But we're thankful that you give us the opportunity to do that crying out instead. So, um, God, I thank you for letting us shine that light. And um, I pray that whatever it is for each person here or online or watches this later, that they figure out what that 10% is for them. And they step 10% outside that comfort zone and, uh, and go on an adventure this week. Because if we wait, we won't do it. So God, stir people's hearts to make that change, to, to take that leap. Because um, it'll be the best decision they ever make. Amen. Guys, next week we'll be at the Harrisburg Improv Theater and Omar and April's microchurch will be hosting. So we'll either see you online or we'll see you live at the Harrisburg Improv Theater. Have a good week.